the definition of Republican and conservative is different to a lot of folks. We need to look at our educational system and its accountability and its deliverables. That's bottom line, the results for the amount of money we're spending. Hello, everyone. I'm Brandon Lewis, founder of the Tennessee Conservative Today. Greg Vital, Tennessee House Representative for District 29, joins us. Greg has lived in the Ottawa, Georgetown area since the early 1970s. He received a business degree from Southern Adventist University. Vital began work as an executive with a healthcare provider before co founding Morning Point Senior Living in the mid 1990s. The company owns and operates senior living and Alzheimer's care facilities in five states. Vital serves on the following committees, agricultural, natural resources, commerce, transportation. He also serves on the transportation business and utilities subcommittees. Greg has received numerous awards for his work in business and in conservative politics. He also sits on numerous boards uh, for business and conservation organizations. Greg, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Brandon, for inviting me, and thank you for the opportunity to chat a little bit about uh, my recent election to the uh, legislature. Uh, it's a real pleasure to also follow Tennessee conservative uh, uh, updates, not only in, legislation, in the legislature, but uh, also prior to joining the legislature. Well, you kind of have to say that, but I'll take it. I'll take it anyway. <laughs> And uh, I'm glad you got elected. Frankly, I wish you had been elected to the Senate years ago, uh, but we will leave that off of here uh, because everybody in the Hamilton County delegation has to work together. But I wish you uh, were already in the Senate. Uh, maybe something in the future could happen there. Uh, Greg, I wanted to have you on the program uh, because I really wanted your thoughts on what it's like to serve up in the legislature as a businessman who is used to getting things uh, done. Uh, my opinion is tip, my, what I have typically found is that my friends who have gone on to elected office who have significant, uh, significant entrepreneurial accomplishments go up into a legislative body, whether it's in Congress or uh, up in D.C. or whether it's in the legislature. And it's a, it can be a little frustrating. Uh, but, you know, what did you find probably uh, the most pleasant? What did you like about it the most as your first year up there in a, in a full session on a special session? And what did you think was a little off or, or weird? That's, that's a real loaded question. Let me back up and say it's a, an honor to be elected and to serve in the footsteps of, of Mike Carter, the late Mike Carter from District 29. Uh, he was a friend. He also was someone that we talked about many years about issues in Nashville. Uh, going to Nashville after an election is a unique experience in the sense it's like going to a new high school. Uh, you have some basic knowledge, but uh, there are a lot of new folks you got to meet. Uh, you got to understand how the process works. Uh, and it's uh, also understanding the hierarchy. Um, the Tennessee legislature is predominantly Republican, as you know. We are a supermajority state. Uh, we have a lot of conservatives. But the definition of Republican and conservative is different to a lot of folks. There's a lot of core principles that are the same. But I must say that all in all, the Tennessee legislature is blessed with a lot of individuals who are committed to making Tennessee a better state and protecting its core values. I, I would say that's what I expected and that's what I saw. At the same time, um, 2,500 bills were, packed, were, were introduced in this first session uh, in January. Obviously the committee process uh, weans that down and very few actually make it to the floor. So you begin to see if there's one reflection coming from the private sector is the importance of advocacy, uh, lobbying the issues, whether they be professional lobbyists or individuals who believe in a cause and wanna get those issues in front of legislators and understanding how that works in the committee process long before it ever gets to the floor. So we always talk about money in politics, but it's involvement and advocacy that I saw in both senses of the word from both professionals and from people, how many times people were up on the hill speaking on behalf of their issues. 
Well, it is interesting. I know we've got a, it, it, it's strange. The, uh, the, I'll, the number one thing that I've discovered since running this publication is there's, there's all the left-leaning corporations that spend about $450,000 per session per member. It's half a million, <laughs> just lobbyists. And then you've got you know, the, the vast majority of PAC money and even the majority of money that goes into campaigns accounts come from that as well. And then you got conservative grassroots primary voters and you know, one has a belief system that's way over here and one has a belief system that's way over there. But the money and the lobbying that comes into the Republican Party is all from the left, but yet the votes come from the right. And so often we get stuff that's kind of like on many issues that that people scratch their head and wonder why. And it, it may be because of some of that disconnect. Um, so there is that big disconnect uh, between those two. And what insights do you have on that? I know that you've been involved so long, even on the other side of it. You know, you've, you've done a lot of issue advocacy work even before coming to the legislature. A lot of people have done virtually no issue advocacy work prior to coming to the legislature. I'd say that's probably half of the people up there, maybe more. So what have you seen? Has anything changed up there? Do you look at it differently now that you've been on the receiving end of it for probably a lot, a, a lot of days or at least, you know, several months up there? I mean, what, what do you see with all that stuff going on up there? First of all, let me just say, I don't know that there's any real bad bills, but the devil's in the details. There's always a little bit of good in everything. It's kind of like sin. You could probably make the case for a few things. But <laughs> it's the borderline. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's the fact of the matter is, um, I give, give, giving you an example to cut through the chase, uh, the, the, the Titan Stadium. I, all of us love sports. We love to participate, but I don't think it's the state of Tennessee's responsibility to provide credit on behalf of a private business in that sense of the word to support a stadium. Um, at the same time, so I voted against it. At the same time, once it passed, we needed to help Nashville pay the obligation. We don't want defaults. And so when we looked at the sales tax collected on motels across the state, they range from about 4% all the way up to eight or 9%. Nashville was around six or seven, and we were gonna allow them to raise theirs one, one cent um, to help pay the bonds. I felt that that was a prudent and responsible decision to make so that we could then pay for it since it was now moving forward. So it's weighing those issues. You know, being a business person and coming to the legislature, you're moving from the executive branch where you made a lot of decisions yourself. You ran a company, you responded by impulse, and now you move to the legislature and you're working by committee, you're working by consensus, um, you're trying to work through something that can build broad bases of support. So there is a total different experience, especially when you're sitting in the seat as a legislator. But I'm thankful I was involved for many, many years on the advocacy side, whether it be conservative issues uh, that were important to me, free enterprise issues on business, the environment and conservation and protecting the, the world we live in. Yes, that gave me enormous experience to sit in this seat and say, how can I represent the people of Tennessee, but more specifically the people of District 29 and balance those decisions? Well, um, I, I'm glad that you have that experience. Um, and I, I would like to, I'm going to ask you a question that's not on here. And I'm not, this isn't, a, I have a big, huge love of state parks and conservation. And it really just kind of dawned on me once I went through here. And I know that you have a big, huge heart for conservation as well. Uh, what is it that they say that everybody likes their own form of welfare or not welfare of socialism? And uh, mine is the parks. I love state parks. I go camping. I enjoy conservation. Um, and, you know, my, my thing is always like with, in government. Well, if well, can everybody enjoy it? And then if the government didn't do it, would this thing exist? And I think the state parks is almost in that area, along with military defense and, you know, the, the courts. I think it kind of fits that that. But I have my own bias. What are your thoughts about and we don't hear about the state parks or conservation much in Tennessee in the news, but is there anything that you've been following or that you're interested in that's related to conservation since you, you have that background? 
conservation and state parks, natural, national parks are part of a stewardship responsibility that I, I think we all bear. And it's spiritual in the sense, you know, during the first days of creation, this world was created. We've been charged with being stewards of our water, our air, the land around us. And so I think we have a responsibility to care about our environment. There are those who cannot own as much property to hike or to fish. There are lands and, and space that really belong to the public. And so I think we do, just like the fence, have a responsibility to take care of those special places so that we can enhance the quality of life that we have. One of the things we're seeing as people move to Tennessee, is they're choosing it for a good business environment, but they're also choosing it for a quality of life. You know, the Great Smoky Mountains, you know, the recreation opportunities on the Tennessee River, the Mississippi River, the Cumberland, the Natchez Trace, all of those contribute to why people choose Tennessee. We're investing more money in state parks, $250, $300 million have been set aside for deferred maintenance. A lot of our state parks, just like national parks, were built along with the trails during the WPA days of FDR when we tried to put people back to work with meaningful, significant opportunity for the work ethic and making a difference. We're now having to pay for some of those things because they need to be replaced or repaired. So I have a commitment to it. There's a balance. Obviously, there's a balance between development and growth and what the government owns and takes care of. But I think, I think if you look at the numbers, 85% of the American population, even higher, believe that parks and public lands are an important part of the responsibility of government. And I have never felt that national parks or state parks are a red issue or a blue issue. They're a red, white, and blue issue. Very good. Well, I'm, if, if you ever have a conservation issue, you'd like to come on here and talk about. I love that stuff. I love the outdoors in Tennessee. I mean, we are the boulder uh, of the uh, boulder, Colorado of the south here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I hope it stays that way. So here at the Tennessee Conservative, guys, we bring you news that no other organization will bring you. We're the only organization that covered anything on social media censorship. We're the only organization that is fighting in any significant way against illegal immigration in our state. We are one of the strongest advocates for school choice. We try our very best to keep Republicans honest on their campaign promises, and we try to fight against the corruption caused by left-leaning corporations in Nashville and the bureaucracy that government has created that works against your interests with taxpayer-funded lobbyists. The only way we can do this, and I kid you not, is with your support. Nobody else is going to do it. If you're waiting on somebody else to be conservative in your stead, that's how we got to the point we are, and that's why we have so few conservative media outlets. So when you go to TennesseeConservativeNews.com slash support, and if you give any amount, we will send you this proud Tennessee conservative bumper sticker. We will also send you this Please Don't California My Tennessee bumper sticker. And we will send you a directory, and I hope this thing changes in the primary of all our state Republicans, uh, both at the House and at the Senate level, so that when they try to do shenanigans, you can call them and tell them to stop. And when they try to do good things, you can ask them to go forward. And finally, if you get $50 or more, or a recurring donation of $10 or more, you will get this proud Tennessee conservative tumbler. Now, this tumbler was made from the melted down sword of Excalibur. It has magical properties. It will imbue you with superpowers. It will correct all of your vitamin uh, deficiencies. It also uh, cures most rheumatoid arthritis. And um, if you were to, to take this, and if you were to put all the campaign promises in here that are made on the campaign trail, this also has like a Wonder Woman's magic lasso. It has the ability to get truth out of people. If you put most Republicans' campaign promises in here, which would fill it up to the very brim, and you close the lids and you wave your hand over it, and then you poured it out, you would get about three drops of conservative policy. That is how magical this tumbler is, and it helps conservative messages and news get out there. Guys, I need your help. Go to TennesseeConservativeNews.com slash support. I'll plainly tell you, last year, we got our taxes back. I put 65 grand into this puppy. So when you say, well, I don't have any money I can't give, I'm going to have to call BS on that. Get in the fight. 
Give today, tennesseeconservativenews.com slash support. I can't do it without you. Don't wait for somebody else to do it because it ain't going to get done. So what do you think you are most interested in seeing happen in the next legislative session? Obviously, like you said, you start out with a bunch of bills. A lot of them get killed. Some of them make it through. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them people have different opinions on. But, you know, what did you see that, that you wish had happened this session, perhaps that didn't? What did, you know, what changes do you think uh, you're looking forward to or, or are you going to be focused upon in the next session? As I went door to door in this campaign, I heard a couple resounding messages. We need to look at our educational system and its accountability and its deliverables. That's bottom line, the results for the amount of money we're spending. That was also a priority in this legislative session, driven by the governor, legislature got on board. The results will be over the next couple of years. And I would expect and hope that we would reevaluate the results of the TISA funding that we put forth almost over a billion dollars, um, but not wait 30 years and say we have a broke system. So that would be number one message that I heard. We need results out of our educational system. This week, I read some information about the declining number of students going to colleges and universities. What are they choosing? They're looking for value. They're looking for something that gets them a job and a profession and a living. That's why vocational and technical education is so important. I don't even like calling it those two things. It's practical and real education for real day wages. Because we have a tendency sometimes to think vocational is just blue collar. No, it's not. The IT world that we now live in is a vocation. The theories and the important philosophies, they're great to learn, but how do we translate them into a job and an opportunity? That's why we've got so many people that are confused because they don't have meaning for their life. And I think that's what education has given so many people is something to do not only with their minds, but with their hands. So education, number one. Number two, as Tennessee is having more and more people move into it, our population exploding, they're coming from other parts of the, of the country and world, crime is an issue. We can, we can boil it down and say, we wanna keep Tennessee values the way they are, that's important, but those are wholesome, spiritual-based, honest values. They're not just Tennessee values. They're, they're all over this country and all over this world, but we're losing them because of the definition of what is right and what is wrong. And so crime was another issue that we saw talked about quite a bit in the legislature, and I think that what we were able to do with the truth in sentencing bill that's one of the things that I heard from people in my office who came up and advocated that they lose a loved one from a horrendous crime, 15, 20 years sentence. And in three or four years, they're back up at the parole board begging to see that person kept in jail because they've ready to move on. Yet the victims have not had a chance to move on. And are we talking about crime in light of criminals? Are we talking about the victims? There's, there's two responsibilities as legislators. People need to serve the sentence for the, the crime, but we also need to help reassure those victims that we have done our responsibility long-term. You know, obviously a whole host of things such as tax cuts, we, we have a lot of revenue coming into the state. And I'm sure just like in our personal lives, the more money we have, the more things we can find to buy. But this is not the state's money. This is the taxpayer's money. We have a responsibility to define those priorities. And we also have a responsibility to return what we can or look for ways to limit taxation in the very beginning. So I'm, I'm proud that we've been able to make some serious investments in um, uh, tax savings and exemptions. You know, for individuals who are feeling the Biden cost of, of energy, the Biden cost of inflation, liberal spending inflation, if you don't want to blame it all on Biden, you got to blame it on liberal policies. Fortunately, 
our policies in Tennessee are conservative and fiscally minded. Well, I think those are big ones. Education is one of my big ones I'm going to be focused on next uh, session. We tried to push school choice legislation, um, and we had a bill up there that would have just, like, let's just get the bottom 10% of kids an opportunity to get out. And you know, like I've talked to you before, you and I have spoke privately, like where I live in Brainerd, I can't send my kids to school there in good conscience. If you've got any kind of means, I mean, you either homeschool, everybody around me, either homeschools or sends their kid elsewhere. And uh, I hope, you know, the funding formula I was all for, and I think it's great accountability. But if you're a fifth grader that can't read or write and you're stuck at some failing school in Brainerd, that funding formula isn't going to really help you out very much. And you, by the time we figure it out, they may have graduated functionally illiterate and moved on with their life, which is always very sad because I grew up like that. Dad couldn't read or write. And a lot of these kids are getting out of these schools, you know, $12,000 a year and they can't read and write. So hopefully, other than just the funding, we, we really get get something else going on. So tell me. Brand, Brandon, let me just say with education, we have to parallel the expansion of our broadband services. As you talk about homeschoolers, more and more people are choosing to homeschool because they had their eyes opened up during the pandemic about what was being taught. And that's another whole subject we can go into. But the fact is people want to take responsibility for their kids. They want to invest in them. We all sacrifice for our children in different ways. But many mothers and fathers now are saying, I can't leave it to the public education system, especially in the inner city. And broadband is the only way we can, can stay connected with online materials and education. It's follow-up for connecting with uh, your banking and, and, and any other opportunities to connect with online. And so we've got to continue to do that because it is an important utility going forward. And Tennessee is investing broadly in broadband across the state. Some of that is federal dollars being reinvested and matched with our dollars, but it is the thrust we've got to focus on. Oh, I agree. You know, when we were looking to move, um, the only thing really, one of the things that kept me from just inching over into Sequatchie County, because I'm sometimes fearful that Hamilton County will will turn blue one day and get fiscally irresponsible from a taxation standpoint. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not Nostradamus, but it could happen. I thought maybe I just safely scoot over to a more conservative county that'll take another 10 years to get there, 20 years to get there. But uh, EPB's broadband access was what kept me, one of the big things that kept me over the line. And uh, when you're out in a rural area where, you know, you're, you've got 1998 or 2010 internet access from an educational standpoint, it's very difficult. And from a business standpoint and a development standpoint, it's very difficult. Well, you've been very kind with your time when you, you've spent so much time up in the legislature. When you come back to the district, you've got you've got you've got things to tend to, Mr. Vital. Uh, you, you're not a retiree that's just up there loafing around. You come back and you got to work. And so not, nothing wrong with the, you know retirees at all. But I'm just saying, you know, it, it's a little bit uh, more of a hectic life for you because you've got your business obligations when you get back in the district and they're not small. Uh, what would you leave our, our viewers with? What would you tell them about um, uh, as we close the program out? And I appreciate your time and I appreciate you being here. Well, I would say that um, it's a great time to represent Tennessee for me. Uh, you mentioned 10 years ago when I ran for the Senate. That's history. Uh, would I have liked to have been elected? Absolutely. But like business decisions, sometimes the decisions that don't work out are the best decisions. Uh, I'm at a place where my company can afford to have me gone, but I can also work on behalf of the 1,600 employees that I have built my company from from Ottawa, Tennessee, from one employee. I know what it means to make a payroll. I know what it means to go to the bank and borrow some other money for investment, and I gotta pay it back. So those all fit together as I look at making decisions related to the legislature. Also, I've had 10 more great years in building my business, but also getting to know people. I've been involved in boards and nonprofits across the community, which give me a deeper insight. We also can see how much money has been spent and what our results are. And we've got to look at that. It's like 2,500 bills. We don't need 2,500 more bills. They're important to somebody. We need to enforce the ones we got. We got to protect the borders we got. And I'm not just trying to throw some buzzwords out there. 
But you know what? As people move to Tennessee, we got to protect Tennessee. We got to protect our, our water and our land and our development. We need jobs, but at the same time, every new subdivision needs to be added up and said, okay, what impact does that have on another 100 or $150 million school? What are the expectations of those folks when they move to Tennessee? And where are we delivering those services or do we expect to deliver those services? So looking at it common sense, I'm glad I have a living. I've been blessed. I work hard at it every day. I'm still involved with my company. This is a part-time job that takes full time almost, but I'm glad to make that contribution for a time. But my goal is to serve in the legislature for a period of time and then hand it to the next one but I hope I can make a difference in the footsteps of those who have served for my area, and that being people like Mike Carter and David Copeland and others from this area who've said, let me stand for conservative principles, let me stand for fiscal responsibility and moral and spiritual values. Well, very good, Greg. Well, I'm excited uh, for you to be up there. Uh, Hamilton County uh, needs uh, more conservatism out of our delegation than sometimes we get. And I know we can always count on you. And I'm glad to have you there. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for letting me join you. And let me just say on behalf of all the other members of the legislative delegation from Hamilton County, we may see things a little bit different, but it is a group as a whole that does communicate. I've, I've found out that other places it doesn't communicate as well, but uh, we can at least bring them together. There's different opinions for sure, but at least they're all committed initially for trying to improve Hamilton County. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much, Thanks. Greg, for being here. Guys, if you enjoyed this interview, uh, you can find it at TennesseeConservativeNews.com. Do hit that subscribe button and also search anywhere you get your podcast for Tennessee Conservative. Give us a five-star review. It really helps. Until next time, I'm Brandon Lewis signing off.